So we'll start out with basic network types and uses. So you see a lot of folks, you'll hear refer to, uh, this is a layer two network, a layer three network. What they're referring to is the OSI model. So the OSI model kind of gives us this building framework for when we're having a network that gets built. You've got the physical layer, that's gonna be your Cat5, Cat6 you know, your Cat6 cable, your fiber cable, that actual physical piece. Wireless technologies actually fit into that a little bit as well. So you'll hear us talk about all day, it's probably today and tomorrow at, at various different points, U.S. Signals Fiber Network. That fiber network is really the foundation of that is that physical layer. We have you know, 10,000 miles of fiber. We laid that layer one in the OSI model out there to be able to build all these other services off of. You also have that layer one physical piece in your office, your CAT6 cable that goes between your, your different computers and your routers and then the switches and all that. Data, or layer two, rather, is the data link layer. That's going to be your Ethernet stuff. You hear a lot of folks talk about Ethernet. Uh, your Ethernet's connected to your own PC, whether that's wireless or whether you're doing a wired connection, all the routers and switches, that's that layer two protocol. It's literally the, like the identity of each machine. There's things called MAC addresses that live at this layer two piece. That's the name or the identity of each and every piece of uh, machinery that talks on a network has that identity and they communicate initially on layer two. Layer three, that's what most people are going to be probably familiar with, IP addresses, IP stuff, the internet's based on it. Uh, that's all that layer three IP-based routing. That will be both local and also over the internet. We'll go over those basic elements as well. Uh, and then you get transport, session, presentation, application. This is like, you know, you hear TCP IP, that term used a lot. The TCP, I, uh, the TCP part lands in transport, IP part lands in network. Uh, but then we just build from there. We start adding all the different protocols we need to get that data to the user and finally present it, and then the application can work with it. So all these pieces are stacked from the lower up to the upper to be able to deliver that data to you in a usable format. You use an Office 365, you're reading your email, that physical piece has to be there to create that connection from you to wherever that email originated and then also pass through the network and then finally arrives on your screen. Then the machines have to be able to talk to each other. The IPs have to tell everybody where to go. That's like, I call it like the GPS of, of, uh, of data transfer or data, data uh, transport rather. They have to know where to go and what my address is and how I get there. And then we build on it from there. So talking about layer one and layer two networks specifically. So again, data, uh, the data link layer, the layer two piece, that is going to be built off of that physical piece. So we're talking about wireless technologies. Wi-Fi kind of gets into layer two a little bit itself as well. Uh, but these layer two services are, it's a data link, like I mentioned, of the OSI model. Processes raw transmissions. I forgot I can read it right here. This is way better. Raw transmissions on that layer. Uh, broadcast multicast traffic. I'll talk about that in a little more detail and why we talk about IP routing, why we use IP routing in the 102 class tomorrow. Uh, but that's where these things happen, where those machines are talking directly to each other. Uh, and how they figure out how to how to communicate with somebody next to them uh, in that data link piece. So this is usually a local area type of technology. So we're going to have a data link, a layer two network here in the office. We're connected to layer two Ethernet here. I can talk to the machine. The TV is connected to layer two. We'll have IPs and things that get stacked on there later in these upper layers, but we have to establish that physical connection or wireless connection and then let those machines talk to each other. That's this Mac and VLAN piece. So the MAC address is the physical address, the hard-coded address that that particular machine has. It's an iPad, a, a laptop, a server, a router, whatever the case may be. That's going to be that actual address that it can use to talk to all the other machines in the local area network. Now, we also do some other things. We get fancy with uh, local area networks and with Layer 2 because as convenient as it is to have a Layer 2 network, everybody can kind of talk directly to each other. What if I want to have my office over there? Maybe you have a campus-type setup or there's an office on the other side of town. I want to have that same type of layer two adjacency to those machines over there. We've got ways we can stretch that. And US Signal has a couple different layer two type uh, networks that we can provide that leverage that fiber network uh, that we have laid out to be able to make that office on the other side of town look like it's local. That's sitting right next to us in the same building. So that's using some of those layer two technologies, but there's drawbacks to that because you get into things that you'll see we talk about broadcast networks and there's collision domains and broadcast domains, things like that. Uh, where when you start stretching and adding too many machines to an Ethernet network, they're all yelling at the same time. So I'll give a good example. We're in a room right here. We could consider this a broadcast network. I'm actually broadcasting to you guys right now. So if I was a computer, you guys are all individual computers. You can all hear me right now. So if you know two guys over here, if Jim and Dave want to have a conversation, and I'm over here talking, they're going to have a hard time communicating because I'm broadcasting to everybody at this time. There's no way to isolate those conversations. So in an Ethernet network, that's what happens. You broadcast to everybody. 
I want to have somebody, um, Brad, in the back of the room over there, he wants to say something back to one of you guys. He's got to broadcast it to the whole room. Maybe it's not intended for us. Maybe he intends it for somebody else in the room, but we're all hearing it. We just have to kind of ignore it. That's sort of what a broadcast network is with Ethernet when you're at that layer too. Everybody's talking to everybody. It becomes inefficient as you start adding a lot of machines. Imagine all the conversations that happen in this room when we're all trying to talk to somebody, but we all have to listen to everybody. It becomes inefficient. So what we do is we start breaking up those layer two networks with layer three networks. We divide those up. So we could be a broadcast domain here, a layer two network, but over in the lunch area, which I don't, I'm not sure if I see anybody over there, maybe Trevor, <laughs> um, sitting over in the lunchroom, they're having a conversation over there. They're their own layer two networks. They're kind of broadcasting to each other, but we don't have to listen to them because they're separated by layer three. But we've got some, you know, we've got Tom standing right by the door. He can actually poke out the door. He's our router. He's our layer three router. He's going to be able to go, hey, Chris just said this. And so he can let them know what I said without hearing all of your conversations at the same time. So it's a kind of a cool way to break up those layer two broadcast domains that are real, can be really noisy and have this layer three conversation between. That's exactly how the internet works as well. It uses those layer three conversations so you don't have to hear everybody from the entire internet. You're hearing just the people that you want to talk to, whether that's Office 365 email or reaching the US Signal Cloud or you know, surfing the web and you know, watching the news or whatever the case may be. So this layer three is the, the third layer on the OSI model. That's providing the, the routing and the switching logic. It, it actually it dips its toe in that layer two network. It's still listening to those broadcasts, but it's taking that and saying, okay, I know who this is for. He's over here in a different network. I'm just gonna send it to that one location, which could be another broadcast network, but at least it's not the same broadcast network. So it bridges those gaps. It brings those layer two networks together and it's very targeted. IPs are very specific on where they're gonna route. We've got some logic built into those. We'll get into that a little bit more in the 102 class tomorrow on how some of that works, how those layer pieces know where to go. Uh, again, that kind of GPS for data on knowing which way to route and how to end up where their destination is gonna be. Uh, layer three network services, obviously US signal. Oh, and by the way, IP specifically living at this layer three, IPv4 and IPv6. If uh, for those of you who are familiar with the IPs, you've probably heard, oh, 192, 168, 100.0, you know, we got this private networks. That's an IP address. That is where that lives on this layer three uh, of the OSI model. There's also something called IPv6, which is a lot, lot more addresses. Uh, just the reason we came up with IPv6 several years ago is because basically we're running out of IPv4 addresses. Slowly but surely, we've done some mitigation measures over the years with private addressing and try to segment some stuff. Um, but I'll get more detail into that too on what that looks like uh, from an IP standpoint, from an IP structure standpoint. How do you tell the difference? Things like subnetting and breaking them down into smaller pieces. But US Signal has a couple of different uh, layer three services that we provide. Dedicated internet is a pretty obvious one, pretty easy one. Every ISP, this is what they're in business for. They're connecting you to the internet. That's a layer three service. A lot of folks probably I mean, have uh, dealt with US Signal internet before. That's going to be a layer three service that gets you to the rest of the world based on that layer three piece. So you're still being in your building. You still got your physical connection. You got a connection to either US Signal or another ISP. The, the layer two is doing its thing. It's making that connection between the machines. Layer three IP gets an IP address and you can send it out to the internet or to the computer that's across the hallway all over the world. Uh, MPLS, layer three private networking, that's intended to be a layer three network like we talked about in the building. So we maybe have a layer two network here, but when you need to say, all right, well, I need a, another building that's across campus or across town, uh, I can use MPLS and keep everything private. I don't have to go out over the internet from a security standpoint, that's a good thing. You're not exposing it to the internet. I wanna have a private IP network so that building that's in a different state or across town looks like it's across the hallway. It looks like it's just another network connected by a router. You know, we got Tom, he's our router. He can be that router that also goes to a, a building that's over in a different state even. So MPLS backhaul, the reason that really can work is because of private connectivity. You're not sending it over the internet. You've probably heard the term VPN before. That's a way to send private traffic over the internet, over a public network. That's not what MPLS is. MPLS is private from end to end. The reason US Signal can do this so well is because we've got roughly 10,000 miles of fiber. So we can take that fiber layer, our, data, our second uh, data link layer on it, and then put private uh, network MPLS on that third. And now everybody has a private IP address, whether they're in California, Florida, Michigan, wherever they might be, it's like they're talking local. That enables a lot of things to happen when you can have a private isolated network that way, obviously security being one of them, 
but also with a lot of applications, printing things like that. It's a lot easier to move that traffic around and communicate in a private network when it's meant to be private, like one company, one entity, versus a public network going out of the internet and having to worry about security and VPNs and tunneling and all that sort of thing. So we'll leverage our fiber to deliver a private layer three MPLS network all over our footprint, just like we can with internet. All making sense-ish so far? Kind of. <laughs> So what is the internet? When we talk about internet, we get internet service, we get it from an ISP. This is basically what we're talking about. And this will be talked about more when we get into a lot of the data center technologies. Obviously, security is a big one. We all know security is a big one. And the internet's how they reach you when you have security breaches like that. But what does that exactly mean? When we start talking about private IP space and public IP space, I threw the Oxford definition up there because it was just easy to use, but it's basically a big mesh, big layer three mesh. So we talked about the layer one, two, and three networks. The internet is just a big layer three network. It's all based on IP, uses something called BGP routing to be able to get through and heal itself if there's a break or you know, to figure out the most efficient way to reach that other machine. So it is a, a big wide area network, public routable IP addresses. Again, we'll talk about the difference between public and private IPs and what they are, especially tomorrow. Uh, but the internet is the definition of public network. It is what, when you're talking about public IPs, that's what they're talking about. It means it's exposed to the internet and the internet can see it. So this is just a simple diagram. You've got a West Coast business, you've got an East Coast business. You can see the foundations getting built. They've got layer one cables going here. They've got a layer two ethernet. They're talking with some Wi-Fi and a laptop. They go to a router, which makes that layer three jump. So that, that's talking in the layer two and it has the layer three. You've got a firewall here because everybody should have a firewall and because you're exposing it to the internet. So that public part of the network, that public space is right in here. It's the entire internet. You've got your local internet service provider. That could be you, a signal, could be somebody else. They have a couple of what they call transit peers. So that's their upstream internet provider. You think about that local internet service provider for you and wherever your location is, that's your internet provider. The tier one and upstream transit peers are the internet service provider's internet provider. So it just sort of happens, it's just, just this growing mesh of how it works. If you happen to be connected to a tier one provider, then you'll have a different type of uh, routing, I guess it might be a little more efficient. And then this local internet service provider is literally responsible for getting your internet traffic out to the tier one providers where it goes and traverses all over the world and does its thing. So it's gonna pass through all these tier one providers, make it over here to this other local internet provider for the East Coast business, get into him, deliver it to the firewall, it'll turn it back into a layer uh, layer two network rather. So it does that public to private IP space change in the firewall, then the router makes it into layer two and hands it to the, to the individual machines where they're connected with layer one. So it kind of just builds up and does that layer three transport. Those upper levels, all the way to seven other levels of the OSI model, they happen on top of all this, obviously that keeps going. We won't dive into each one of those, but there's a bunch of different protocols and you know, TCP and everything else that goes over it as well. So the internet and public networks, um, US Signal's public IP backbone, this is our wide area network, basically the long haul fiber that we have, that roughly 10,000 miles. Uh, within each, like a lot of these metropolitan areas, there'll be more dense metropolitan fiber that reaches each one of those individual buildings. This is our giant layer one network. This is what we built for fiber to reach our customers and our buildings. If you know a little bit of history about US Signal, we were founded as a carrier's carrier many years ago, over 20 years ago which meant all we were doing was transport from on-ramp to off-ramp in various different markets. So we had large AT&T and Level 3 and Cogent, all these other big carriers. They needed a way to get their traffic from Chicago to Detroit or down into Indy or wherever it might be, uh, in and out of Grand Rapids. And where we would meet them is that it may be a data center, maybe a, a switching a central office from a local telephone company. A lot of them meet there as well. So we've got several data centers of our own, which we're gonna talk extensively about the next couple of days. But we also have hundreds of points of presence. In other words, central offices, other people's data centers, individual private companies, things like that. Those are all the things that our fiber network taps into that allows us to transport all of these different services over our big old honk and layer one network. Now we sell uh, layer two services as well, which will do layer two ethernet transport on our fiber footprint from place to place. And we can also partner with other access providers that are outside our footprint that'll give us that last, last mile access. So a company may have a building on net or in Kentucky where we're not there, we'll haul it back to our network as quickly as we can. Maybe that's AT&T, for instance. They've got entrance into a building that we're not particularly in. So we'll use them for that last mile kind of layer one access. And then we'll put our services over the top of that. Could be uh, we provide internet. It could be we provide layer two transport from one point to another. You know, you've got uh, manufacturing companies and everything else throughout our footprint. 
we, they need to get you know data from point A to point B. So we'll let them ride our fiber network, or maybe they need internet access. We'll plug into it, use our fiber to backhaul it to our transit peers. We become an ISP at that point, and we send it upstream to the internet so they can communicate anywhere they need to in the world. But by having this big old backbone and numerous transit peers, we actually leverage our own fiber network to be that ISP for those end customers. These, I meant to click all of these, don't I? So these are the US signal individual transit peers. So you remember that ISP we had on that previous slide where just had, he had two and the guy on the other side just had one and that's how we, they connect, your local ISP connects out to those tier one providers that transport and create the internet, the big IP mesh. This is US signals answer to being an ISP. So if you're sitting in Grand Rapids or in, down in Ohio or Indiana, wherever, and you get an internet service from US Signal, you've actually got all five of these transit peers going up to those tier one providers. And most of these transit peers have multiple physical connections. So we have multiple 10 gigs and 100 gig upstream connections that we'll provide for our customers. So they tap into our internet. Now they have a protected backbone with many, many transit peers. This is a huge advantage especially when you start talking about US Signal hosting production level services. We have data centers for co-location, we have data centers for cloud hosting, and even just providing internet, plugging our fiber into a particular building and giving them internet services, like we were talking about fiber directly to the buildings before. Uh, this is what they get when they get the internet service from US Signal. And they could also be transporting MPLS in this as well. So if you're sitting, let's use Grand Rapids. I mean, that's where we're at right now. We're sitting in Grand Rapids, Michigan. We get internet service with US Signal. You now have access to this entire backbone. So you can see your connections can, you know, maybe your connection's going out Detroit or going Fort Wayne or down into Ohio, wherever the case may be. It'll ride our backbone to get to that transit pier and then go up to those tier one providers and out to the internet everywhere. So this is a big advantage because maybe Cogent has an outage. Maybe AT&T goes belly up. They have something wrong with their IP network. If you're an AT&T AT customer and you have their internet, you're going to be down. You're going to be directly connected, even though they're like a tier one provider. If they have a routing issue, you're going to be down. You're connected to US Signal, you're not even going to know there was an issue because maybe the traffic was going out to AT&T. That's really not even not something you have to figure out. It's something that just comes naturally with the IP routing, what they call BGP and the internet. The internet just decides where the closest, most efficient route is. So you're sitting in Grand Rapids trying to reach somebody in New York it might go down and take this AT&T because that's the closest peering relationship with that New York location and their ISP. AT&T goes down, you'll just start routing out Cogent in Detroit, or you'll start routing out Lumen or whatever down in Indiana. Take one of those other paths, it just, it's called BTP reconvergence. The routing just adjusts to heal wherever that outage or, that, or outage or that break took place. So that's a big advantage US Signal built into our network is to make sure we had that capability for our customers when they're having production data running on our fiber network and in our data centers. And an MPLS. This is another way US Signal can leverage the fiber, but a lot of people do private LAN and MPLS services. Now, private LAN obviously is gonna be in your building. Like we talked about right here, our little broadcast domain that we have in the room. Again, we're connected to various different parts within the hotel, within your office, you're gonna have a lot of computers, laptops, printers, all these things that are on the network. That's your private LAN, your local area network. It's great for fast local communication between these workstations, between printers and all this stuff. It can use layer two services built on whatever that layer one physical type of connectivity is. Uh, but there's some considerations there. We talked about the broadcast and collision domains, which are really, you shouldn't be having those anymore. Um, but broadcast domains, again, we get a big room. We start adding too much stuff in there and it becomes congested. The broadcast traffic actually utilizes bandwidth. So just like I'm broadcasting to you, I'm sort of using the air to talk to you guys. Bandwidths have a, or networks rather, have a finite amount of bandwidth in them. You get a bunch of computers all talking, it becomes so noisy, now you've consumed all your bandwidth with traffic that's not intended for other people. You're, you're targeting one machine, everybody else has to listen to it, it's consuming their bandwidth that they have available on their network, even though that traffic wasn't intended for them. So that's one drawback when you start doing very large layer two networks, which is why layer three MPLS, again, those layer three domains, that layer three router breaks up those broadcast networks. You can transmit and have all kinds of offices all over the place now, and they're communicating efficiently, not just yelling at everybody simultaneously at the same time. Uh, there's also latency concerns as well when you start having things farther away. You don't want too high a latency on a layer, a layer two network. Layer twos work on frames, layer three works on IP packets, and so they're, they handle latency a little bit different way. So there's efficiencies to be seen there. There's adjustments you can make to make it more efficient to run on a layer three IP network, uh, but also security risks. It's really easy if a bad actor was to get in here 
it's really easy for them to see all these machines. They're all layer two. They're easily accessible. So you got you're talking about a ransomware attack, something like that. We're going to get a lot more into security as we build on these uh, sessions today and tomorrow. Uh, this is a, a definitely a concern. How do you break up those risk domains, those security domains, to make sure you've got some you've got some stop gaps in there. You've got ways to stop or at least slow down the bad actors before they're getting in and seeing every single machine and encrypting every single machine. So there's security concerns as well. And I, I mentioned data, uh, the distance limitations, layer one limitations. Uh, that is not only latency based, but also just the physical media. Like a standard Ethernet, you know, you're running Cat Five. A lot of buildings around here have Cat Five. You're going to get about 250 feet, and then the signal is going to be degraded. You got to put a switch. You got to put something in to regenerate that signal. Fiber can go a lot farther, obviously, but not every building, especially the old buildings in Grand Rapids. You're lucky if they have Cat Five. Uh, maybe run some new Cat Six or something, or use wireless technologies, which still will have distance limitations. So you start looking at doing IP networks. You know, internet would it be easier if I've got a building across the way to just do an MPLS with a provider, keep it private, but now they're you know they can be miles or hundreds, even thousands of miles apart, and you can still communicate like it's a private network uh, without having to go over the internet. That's really what MPLS is used for. Uh, Multi-protocol label switching. It's a really fancy name, but it's basically used for uh, private network connectivity over wide areas, typically. Uh, a lot of providers do it, US Signal included. So extending on this a little bit more, and this is what I was mentioning before, how you can use a one or a combination of these different uh, network techniques uh, to extend your network out. So US Signal, we have optical waves. You heard me mention that earlier about, that's how US Signal started, was doing these optical waves and you know selling this transport from, from city to city for these large carriers. Well, enterprise companies and stuff, they might have a use for a 10 gig wave or even bigger, 100 gig wave to go from one location to another. So they'll get an optical wave from US Signal. Maybe they need to have multiple locations to have that, that data protected as well. So switch protected in case a fiber cut happens, they can route the other way and it protects that data and they keep your production facilities up and running. So we can incorporate that. We can do layer two services like we talked about, Ethernet. We can use MPLS. We can even use Internet. We start bringing all these things together, like with a big MPLS network and all these different access techniques, whether it's fiber or we go, you know, we have an access partner who does a last mile connection for us, whatever the case may be. They can all be brought into this big MPLS network. And even home workers can use VPNs and their local Internet provider to get tapped into this MPLS network as well. Because it's layer three, we're not having to worry about really noisy connections. So the home internet would actually work. They would, the way they would tap into this MPLS is they got really lucky and we had fiber into their building uh, or some other kind of access like that. Or they could use a, VN, a VPN with their local internet provider. Or maybe we do run a last mile access piece out there. We partner with you know, AT&T and a bunch of other folks that have copper and fiber out to these different buildings and houses. Uh, we can get access in there as well. And they get into that private network. So this can also switch your voice. So I, you know, most voice services are IP-based now anyway, and MPLS is an IP-based network. So with all these data centers and head ends and remote users and everything else, and even your voice services, they can all run over this big MPLS network, connect all those buildings together for voice data, traffic, printing, you name it, all those things can be brought together in one. It's just a big layer three wide area or metro area network, but it's all private IP-based, so it seems like it's local, like it's right in the next room, but it could be in the, uh, you know, one or two states over. So putting it all together. So what we want to do is we want to say, okay, we know we got layer one, layer two, layer three capability. We can do fiber. We can do that. We, oh, how do I get all these things brought together? And this is where we start talking about using VPNs, basically using the internet to get a private connection. We start talking about using MPLS somewhere, maybe building some direct fiber into something else. Um, VPNs is a big one, but the idea, and I'll talk about that in a minute, the idea is to get all these different LANs. You might have an office. Maybe this is a US Signal data center. This is a headquarters office. This is another location. Maybe this is even a public cloud or an Office 365 connection. Getting them all to talk in one form or another, how do I bring all these pieces together? The, the, the basic solution is you have to have private IP connectivity, connectivity in, almost every, in almost every case. Eventually, you're going to have to figure out how to get that. So you can leverage things like VPNs. Uh, if you're familiar with the VPN virtual private network, it basically uses an internet connection to tunnel through private data. So it takes an encrypted tunnel and sticks your private data over the internet. So you could use, at a, you could be at a coffee shop, you could be at home using your local internet provider, and you could set up a VPN, whether that's from an individual machine or a, maybe an IPsec VPN from an entire office. That's going to take and use your internet access through anybody. It, could, it doesn't have to be US Signal. You could have internet access through AT&T or through Comcast. 
set up a VPN that targets US signal or some private network, but that private network would be whatever you have in common. So this wide area network that everybody's connecting to, if you're gonna be doing this for business type of, of transactions and data, you're gonna to wanna to have that on a private network, not just open over the internet, because obviously that's more dangerous from a security standpoint, a lot less efficient. VPNs allow you to do that, using your local anybody internet to establish a private connection. All that does is it creates a, it literally is like, like they talk about it being a tunnel, so it's a, an encrypted tunnel that it creates between you and one other location, whether that's your laptop with a client-based VPN to a machine, maybe at your corporate headquarters, or it's an entire building that's doing a VPN into your central headquarters office or maybe a data center. It's creating that virtual private piece, that, that encrypted tunnel, so that private traffic can go over the internet. That way you can connect from anywhere. This is what most companies do when you're, you know, you got road warriors out at the airport, you got your laptop, you're traveling somewhere. You can just connect to the airport Wi-Fi, set up your VPN, and now you're protecting your traffic by making it private IPs going over the public network, and those prying eyes from the outside can't see what that data is on the internet. But that will bring, uh, this is the other way. I wanted to make sure we talked about optical fiber rings because this is the way a lot of our enterprise customers leverage our fiber backbone today. They use our fiber backbone, backbone to bring all of this together. So they want to have a high bandwidth, very high throughput, very transparent because they're doing really the heavy lifting on the outside. We're just providing that transport and protection. Maybe it's protected, maybe it's direct. They have ways to do path protection, switching, and all kinds of fancy stuff. But these large enterprise companies and the bigger carriers, they need to get from point A to point B. And this is a simplified version. So they got a, a remote office here, another remote office here. This is their main headquarters where their internet is. So you don't need to have internet at either one of these locations because they're connected on this big fiber protected backbone, optical ring in this case. Uh, but this could be a lot of different ways to, uh, to uh, design this. So these guys can get internet access if they got to reach Office 365 or they're just surfing the web, they can use this private optical ring to get internet access from their headquarters internet feed. So they only need a single internet feed, a single ISP over here, and they can transport all of their private data this way as well. Very transparent, layer one and a half, I like to call it, when they're talking optical waves. Uh, it can be protected, it can be, like again, very high bandwidth and transparent, so they can put the protection mechanisms they want in place and send the type of data they want to back and forth over this uh, 10 gig, 100 gig, or there's old OC uh, optical circuit like uh, connections to uh, old Sonnet technology we still use. Uh, but that's, it's an enterprise level service or a carrier level service typically. So high bandwidth and very transparent. And then this is just that last piece about how to bring all these different services together when you've got a completely disparate amount of, of different, you've got branch offices on at and I mean, they're all on the internet. Somewhere, headquarters, mobile users, maybe they're all over the place, got uh, people driving around people at the coffee shop working wherever they need to work from, they can just leverage the internet to create these private tunnels between. You can get uh, VPN devices for your mobile house, that kind of thing. This is how you can bring and make a corporate business network with secured data using just disparate internet connectivity from wherever it comes from. This is a way to do it, how to get all this stuff put together uh, so you have a, a, a private network. You can establish a private network by leveraging the internet to do it. You've got to make sure it's secure. You have to make sure you're setting up your VPNs correctly, uh, but you because you need to protect that data from the internet. This is very simplified version, but this also you can see with all the tunnels going each direction, it, you need to manage it correctly. It takes a little bit to watch it. You've got to have somebody who knows how to set up the VPNs, who can manage the VPNs, and you're not accidentally running your corporate traffic over the open internet because you didn't get the VPN set up correctly, or maybe you just can't connect at all because the VPN wasn't set up correctly. So it can be done, it's, it's, it's the way it's been done for years and it absolutely works. But a lot of times we, we look at that and we start talking about what is a better way to accomplish that? How can we make this easier and have centralized management, more uniform uh, security policies applied everywhere, where anybody can plug in anywhere they need to and they just naturally get connected to their corporate network. And that's the SD-WAN and SASE code. That's where we, what we wanna kind of touch on that as, a, as kind of to close up this session. So SD-WAN is a well, software-defined wide area network, and SASE is Secure Access Service Edge. A lot of people have probably heard about SD-WAN already. It's been around for several years. It's kind of evolved as it's gone. It started to be kind of just a way to bring disparate connections together, and you could connect to one central uh, private-type network. Now, it is still essentially that, but it's gone way beyond that now. And with SASE, it's more of a framework, a security framework, on how these different devices connect and how they actually access both the private 
pieces, the private entities and endpoints that they want to reach, and how, even how they get to the internet. I'm going to kind of just reference this page here a little bit. You can see we've got mobile sites, mobile users, Internet of Things. You get your, your your ring cameras and all that kind of thing. Branch offices, headquarters, large corporate sites. They're all accessing this big ring. Now, if I go back one page, or actually two pages, sorry. This is that big optical fiber ring we talked about. How it's protected, high bandwidth capability. It can transport this stuff privately. You'll notice this has kind of a similar idea from an architectural standpoint. So people are using their own individual internet to connect into this big ring that then feeds them to whatever private entity or even the internet they want. I know this is getting a little weird, but let's say this device here, they're in an airport, they have local internet access because they're at an airport or a coffee shop or whatever. You'll notice they're not actually reaching the internet, they're reaching this protected security layer first, the SASE layer. Then internet's here. Internet is something they would access on the other side of their SD-WAN and SASE. They're literally using the internet to access the internet. But there's a very, very good reason that they're doing that. They're getting the, the only thing, they're talking about zero trust technology where only the certain data that you want to allow is allowed to go through. So they use this SASE framework with SD-WAN. They have a little client on their phone or on their laptop or at home or wherever it is. And that client says you can only talk to this SASE network. And that SASE framework and through SD-WAN is also highly protected. So if there's a node that goes bad, something else that breaks, it's got a million different ways it can go. So it's all switch path, logically protected, all that sort of thing. If they say, I just want to get to the internet, it's going to say, okay, I see who you are. I've authenticated you now. I know what kind of data you can have. And by the way, I also have a whole set, an umbrella of security policies that we're going to use that says you can go here, but you can't go here. You want to surf that really weird site out of China? Yeah, no, that's not going to work. We're not going to let you go there. And there's other things. You can, you can have a uniform policy. So all these different types of people, offices, things, individuals, laptops, they're all treated by the same amount of rules or maybe you know, subsets of rules that the IT administration staff has decided ahead of time and can be uniformly applied to all of them much easier. You're not setting up individual VPNs everywhere and having to manage each one of those individual VPNs over whatever internet provider they happen to have. You're plugging into the SASE framework using SD-WAN to optimize the connection. And if they want to get to the internet, they can, as long as you allow them to do so if you're administrating, you know, administering that particular network. But they can also reach their data center, their private cloud, their public cloud. They can reach US signal, software as a service. They can reach all of these things, but only the things that we're going to allow them to reach are the traffic that's going to be allowed through this protected connectivity ring. Again, that's that zero trust piece. What zero trust basically means is, if it's something that we allow that we are, are saying it's okay ahead of time, giving it pre-permission, then we're allowing it through. If it's not, it doesn't get through. From a security standpoint, this is a big advantage because somebody, you know, uh, uh, even if they click on an application or they click on a uh, attachment or something that they weren't supposed to and they infect their machine, that machine is now trying to spread. They're getting hit with ransomware. The ransomware is trying to do its thing. The malware is trying to spread. This system is going to go, okay, well, it's trying to phone home. It's trying to go out here or there. It's trying to do a brute force from the outside. It's not going to allow that traffic. It's simply just not going to go through because it's not predefined as being allowed on this SASE security framework piece. So this from a management standpoint and from an access standpoint, it really brings a new level to the SD-WAN. SD-WAN has its magic sauce about routing and, and how it can really optimize the connectivity for everybody. But when you put the secure access service edge on top of it, now it has uniform uh, security policies that can be much easier maintained no matter where they're at. And on top of that, this is the really cool part. It has smart routing at the application level. So I'm going to talk a little bit more about this tomorrow. I'm sure it's going to come up several times over the next couple of days. So you know, this mobile user or one other user, you know, they can see that, okay, I want to reach like, maybe the public cloud. I'm going to Office 365, for instance. I'm over at AWS. Um, but I also have private cloud at US Signal. And I also need to know we got some stuff in co-location in our data center. You're, when you open up your, your Outlook, for instance, it knows it needs to reach AWS to get Outlook uh, authenticated and get your email, whatever the case may be. It'll find the optimum routing, because remember, you're tapping into this protected SASE and SD-WAN network and architecture. It'll find the optimum path for that particular application, which way do I want to go? And something that this drawing doesn't really represent very well is when you have branch offices like this, these branch offices can have multiple connections. Maybe you've got US Signal MPLS fiber. It's great, reliable, super fast, but you also have internet at your office. If one or either of those goes down, the other one will just simply carry the traffic. But on top of that, what's even better is if you're trying to reach US Signal's data center or our private cloud, it's going to see that MPLS circuit as being way faster and more direct, more efficient. It's going to take that path automatically. You're trying to reach AWS, you're trying to go out to some other internet location, 
Maybe the internet connection that you have at that office is going to be more efficient. It can make those logical, real-time routing decisions as it's trying to get out to these different things and make it the most efficient it can be, and it's also fault tolerant that way. What that allows you to do is get commodity access, so less expensive access, especially at these hard to reach offices, whatever internet you can find. Let's plug in a, you know, a 4G, 5G router and go off the, the local cell tower. Let's do a Starlink system and throw it up there because I can't find any other internet available. I have that problem at my house, by the way, um, my new house. So you can find whatever access might be available, and then even more than one. You can use multiple internet access pieces, and the, the SASE and SD-WAN framework will pick the most efficient one and will route around any issues that it finds. So it'll be fault tolerant and more efficient as far as the routing goes. So this is something US Signal is rolling out very soon. I'm not sure if we have a hard date on it yet, but we're, we're coming very close. Uh, to where we're gonna be able to use and leverage our fiber network and our infrastructure and then have this as a service layered on top of whatever, it, whether it's US signal access or not, you're gonna be able to have this type of SD-WAN and SASE deployment for either for yourself or your customers, if you're a partner, uh, to be able to lay out this type of efficiencies. And it's, it's uh, some of the newest technology, some of the best technology we've seen out there.